So uh, today is economics day. Uh, economics! <laughs> Seriously, it is time we need to reclaim the we need to reclaim this territory from uh, my two great passions are education and economics, and, and in both of them they have been frozen by the cold, dead grey hand of the establishment. The way our economic systems work, the way our economic, the way our education systems work, are shameful, and this is territory that we need to reclaim. It's not, I know that in the so um, I discovered when I was living. Uh, I, I went to Finnhorn for a week instead for eleven years. <laughs> And during that time, I realized that I was an educator. And uh, so, over the years, as I, as I have become totally fascinated by the, the outer processes of the economy, of how economic structures need to change, I've become progressively more fascinated by the learning processes, by not the, the curriculum is the, the what an education pedagogy is the how and feeling that there's a real the power in transforming the learning processes gives us, it's a necessary part of our path. So, um, my, my talk today is entitled Pathways to Prosperity. Um, and a little, just to say that, that uh, if you're expecting an economic expert to come and tell you a shopping list of one of the pathways to prosperity, that's not what I'm going to do. Uh, and in fact, it's not something I can do because it's not something that anybody can do because we don't know. We live in a highly fractured, complex, we are in a deep pit in the mother of all messes. And the only way through and out of this is through a mobilization of the collective intelligence. Something I really enjoyed when the, the Zapatistas are a popular uh, resistance movement in, in southern Mexico of indigenous people, and when they were asked what they wanted, they said, we want a world in which many worlds can fit. So there is not one solution, there are multiple solutions, each of which needs to be specific to place. So the only way we can do this, I think, is to become much better thinkers to, 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 to find ways of accessing intelligences way beyond, much more creative than those stimulated by the current education system, which is where I think the link between economics and economy reside. Um, I want to invite you, I'm aware that th th these are subjects about what, which I've been very passionate, and when I've been passionate, I can uh, be known to speed up. Uh, so in the economics classroom at Schumacher College, we've got a sign L for language. So I'm going to invite you, if I'm using language or speaking at a speed that is uncomfortable, to just do that. That will, that will help you. Um, so another, just by way of introduction, um, Another, uh, what my favourite of Einstein's many inspired quotes, that I have this above my desk at work, is if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on solving the problem, I'd spend the first 55 minutes getting the question right. Because I know that once I've got the right question, I can easily answer it inside five minutes. And so I, I stress this because because what we need to be doing is to mobilize a much greater intelligence, collective intelligence, in a way that currently our educational and economic structures are designed in such a way as to disempower us, I mean to re-empower ourselves, as thinkers first of all. So this is a this this inquiry into how do we do this? How do we bring together the best of a renewed education system into a renewed economic system? I've been sitting on this inquiry for a couple of years, and there were a couple of leads, a couple of threads that led me in. So the first is, in common with all other academic programs, I teach a, a, a postgraduate program called Economics for Transition, and in common with all programs, we have an external examiner. Uh, our first external examiner was this wonderful Dubliner uh, called John Barry, and he just made, he, he reflected that our students were strong in vision but weak on pathways. So, and I think this is generally in terms of left leaning, green uh, progressives who will be strongly represented here. I think this is a common 
feature. I think Ross has done some fine work in really thinking through, okay, this is where we are, this is where we need to get to, how on earth could we get from A to B? But for the most part, I think we're weak on having really systematically thought through the process by which we might make the transition. And it leaves us without a map. Or if there's not one map, there are multiple maps. But we do need to, if we're going to be intelligent, so not just in our own places, creating beauty and creating fulfillment, but actually using that in a way, where are the leverage points in the system where we can have maximum impact? We need to do some strategic thinking. So this was my first way in, was John's observation that our students are strong, on vision but weak in pathways. We were, we've really strengthened that. And I want to share some of the tools that we use at the college to help students th through this process. Uh, the second way in was noticing um, if you've been paying attention to the world of economics education. Uh, oh. Oh. So I generally, I. I used to be a performance storyteller. I generally don't leave myself vulnerable to this kind of stuff uh, because I generally don't trust it and I generally trust my own ability to you know, make them lose. Go for it. Go for it. For it. In this case, I've left myself vulnerable. Okay, so I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap. I kind of assume this might happen. So, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So, the, so the first way in was our external examiner noticing that we were weak in pathways. The second way in was noticing that in at the moment around the world there is a student rebellion against the way economics is being taught. Uh, many organisations being created, um, rethinking economics, reteaching economics, or even economics teachers are rebelling. And what, they're, what they, they critique is that we're being taught only fundamentalist free market neoliberal economics. Feminist economics, absent. Ecological economics, absent. Behavioral economics, absent. The list was on. But what really struck me when I looked at these protests was that they're almost entirely limited to the curriculum. So the implicit assumption, I don't think this is an assumption that they've really thought through, but the implicit assumption is if we change one set of textbooks for another set of textbooks, it's all going to be okay. And I, one of the things I learned early uh, working at Finborn, uh, where we brought theatre in, we, I mean, I think this is, how many of you have done a Gaia education program? Gaia education. So you know from working in this way that it's not limited to sitting in a room studying books. There's a lot of bringing in theatre, inviting the body, inviting emotions, inviting intuition into the classroom. And I knew from doing that, from having brought particularly my own interest in theatre, in bringing embodiment into the classroom, that almost immediately what had been an abstract, clever, out there problem to be solved suddenly became much more viscerally inhabited. And the students, there was almost immediate catharsis and tears the anger as we found ways of representing the concepts in our bodies and inviting the emotions into the process. So this idea that we can somehow transform the world, that we can transform our economies by changing one set of textbooks for another, but leaving the students in rows in the cold, grey library, felt to me to be probably pretty superficial. Good. I'm going to show you some shocking images. I apologise in advance. This is a Theatre of the Oppressed workshop at uh, Schumacher College. Um, from the tradition of theatre, of um, pedagogy of the oppressed from Brazil. Um, so the idea that we change one set of textbooks for another set of textbooks, it's going to be okay, it's not. So what I did was I started, I, I realised that the people behind Rethinking Economics, they're intelligent people, so why are they so focused on the curriculum but not the pedagogy? And the conclusion that I came to is that this is, it's almost like a geological substructure in our thinking that we don't even challenge it because we've stopped even seeing it. That it's simply that education looks a certain way and there are certain assumptions about how you do education. And so I started inquiring, what are those assumptions? And I came to three. And I'm sure there are more, but these are the three that I came to that I think it's really important to see that this insidiously infects our thinking to the degree that we no longer even notice 
the level of dysfunctionality. So, and apologies for these shocking images coming up. So one is, this is a core belief, is that there is a fixed body of knowledge to be transmitted by the expert to the passive observer, the passive student, in silo-specific physics, history, French, chemistry, core assumption underlying our whole educational practice. A second, which, and this is the one that I think is the really big one, is the belief that the intellect is the only legitimate source of knowledge generation. So your body is a vehicle for transporting your brain. Your emotions are not invited in because that's purely subjective. And of course, subjectivity is forbidden because it's not part of the scientific method. And the third, oh, apologies for this, oh, is that education is an individual pursuit, that collaboration is called cheating. <laughs> and the result... It's, I, kind of, I, I feel, I feel the, the, the spirit of Gunter Powley channeling through me saying, this is absurd, this is crazy. I mean, it really is, honestly, when you think about it, it is, it is insane. And the result is this. This is the most shocking image of all, because we all recognize it. That's the result. Amazing. That we can take this beautiful, creative, playful, engaged, dynamic beings and have them hating going to school. So I'm just going to run quickly through what I've been doing is studying the neuroscientific, psychological, sociological evidence that increasingly is contradicting these assumptions. So this first one is that knowledge is not fixed and set. It's socially constructed and context-specific. And I love this quote. I'm just going to let you read this quote. It's a beautiful quote from a South African activist that I think just beautifully... You can read it? You can read it. Let me read it. It says, There is a delicate relationship between the world out there and sense, the sense-making that we bring to the world. The phenomenal world we live in arises from the conversation between sense and sense-making. So it's not, a, it's not a body of knowledge to be transferred. It's something that needs to be inhabited by each individual being with what they bring to the inquiries. We know, this is Gunter Pauli territory again, we know that the least effective way of teaching is delivering lectures. Students re recall within 48 hours have lost 90%. And yet this is the dominant form of educational practice. Again, this uh, challenging the idea that we learn only through the intellect. This growing neuroscientific evidence that the idea of separating rational thinking from the emotions in the body is simply, it's not how it happens. The cognitive process involves thinking and the emotions and the body. And one thinker in particular, linguist George Lakoff, go so far as to say that all new knowledge comes in through the body and is then transferred through the use of metaphor to other parts of our system. So, and any educators in the room? I mean, I mean, you will know this from simply the practice of watching what happens to a student when their body comes into the process. So, um, there's a, a lovely quote here from the... the um, the British journalist George Monbiot, acknowledging our love for the living world does something that a library full of papers and sustainable development can never do. It engages the imagination as well as the intellect. So, in other words, if we are to... <clears throat> if we are to bring our full intelligence to this inquiry, the inquiry we have at the moment is how do we shift our systems to bring what are the pathways to prosperity from the place of dysfunction we are in at the moment to a desirable future. And we're not going to do that by sitting in the library reading books. I'm an academic. I love sitting in the library reading books. Uh, but I also lead one of the, and um, probably the world's only economics program, where students earn credits by doing solo fasting vigils in sub-zero temperatures in the woods because they can get so much from a book, but if we're to repair our relationship to the other than human world, we need to bring our emotions, our bodies, our whole selves to the process. 
So, that is, that's the first bit, is in terms of what are the, uh, the, the, the inquiry that I'm bringing, I've totally lost track of time. Ina, can you tell me how much longer I've got? Ten, great. So, the, 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 the inquiry that I'm bringing to you is a kind of the challenge, the provocation, is that there's a temptation in the field of economics to assume that there, this is what we've been trained to think. There are experts out there who we go to for the solutions, the answers. There aren't. They don't have them. Economics courses are still being taught that don't include the crash in 2008. And they don't include them because it's theoretically impossible to have happened. And so you choose to omit it from the curriculum because it couldn't have happened. Gunter Pauli, this is crazy! <laughs> it is crazy, it is, it is, it is insane. So the, 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 the two pathways that I'm trying to open up here this morning are on the one hand revolutionising the educational systems and we're going to be exploring this in the workshop just after this session in the morning, is how do we bring embodiment, how do we revolutionise your educational systems so that at, at the moment the, in surveys of potential employers they're saying universities are not producing what we need. We need systems thinking, pattern seeking, transdisciplinary people who can work in teams, who are emotionally intelligent, who are spiritually intelligent, and the universities are not doing that. So we need to radically reinvent the system or create our own system in parallel in which we can raise a generation of people who can take on the challenge of really asking these deep questions. What are the pathways? So the second bit of the talk that I wanted to, to bring to you is some of the tools that we bring to our economic students that are specific. So I'm bringing John Barry in again, going back to Schumacher College and saying what are some of the tools that we provide them to help them become better thinkers about plausible futures and how we might get there. So I want to introduce three tools. The first is something called Three Horizons. Ken, I want to check, has anybody worked with Three Horizons? A couple. It's a, re a strong recommendation that you look at it. Um, so, just in very brief, um, the, the red line, this, where we are at the moment, so it begins on the left-hand side with, this is where we are at the moment. There is an existing set of norms, behaviours, rules, regulations, institutions that hold in place the current system. However, at the moment, if you look at the bottom of the graph in the green line, there are shoots of the new, there are lots of new, particularly at the moment, a period of deep transition, there are lots of things bubbling up, many of them represented in this gathering, that hold the seeds of possibility for a radically new future. So, the students are then invited to imagine, not to be totally science fiction, but to really think through what could an ideal future look like in farming, in education, in transport, whatever field it might be, that there are seeds already in the field that if we, if we nurtured them, if we fed them, they could lead into that, into that third horizon, which is the green. And then the critical bit of the process is the blue, is the transitional period. What are the key points in the system where we need to be intervening that will that will further enable to grow the seeds that are, that are in the seedbed and that will repress the development of the currently dominant system. So, strong recommendations, a very helpful tool for escaping something called proximity bias. Proximity bias means that if you're close to something, it can feel like it's totally permanent and it's been there forever. It hasn't. The current system, neoliberal economics, as recently as 40, 50 years ago, was seen as being slightly mad by most economists. So there was a process by which they changed this, and we need to learn from this. So, number one is use of three horizons, beginning to, to look to see what are the seeds of the future that are germinating at present that could flower, bloom into something, and what would we need to do in this interim uh, horizon two that would enable that to happen. A second, 
A second tool is uh, a, a, a great piece of work called Points to Intervene, Intervene in Systems. Systems thinker Donella Meadows. Um, and um, she, she notices, if you look at the left of the, this is probably far too small to read, at the left of the graph is, it's the stuff that we tend to focus on. It's the governments tend to focus on. It's, for example, setting the regulations on the, the acceptable level of emissions from factories or miles per gallon uh, in car manufacture, for example. And this is where we tend to focus, but the real transformative changes happen at the other end of the graph in terms of what is the purpose of the organization, of the, of the system, what are the rules of the system, and really looking to see how can we get down again to the geological substructure to change. If we look at education, for example, rather than simply playing with the curriculum, you look at what is the purpose of education, looking deep down at the core geological substructure. So I want to give one little example. If I ran over by five minutes, would it be the end of the world? Thank you. That was, was a rhetorical question. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, just a little, a little um, uh, example here of uh, a friend of mine called Paul Dickinson. Spends a lot of time at Findhorn. And he used to be... Oops. He used to be one of these guys who dressed in a, in a polar bear suit and went to climate change conferences and held placards. And uh, he said to himself, this isn't really working, is it? So he then, using in part, he's a, he, he is a former student at Schumacher College and he's aware of the points to intervene in the system. And so he went, what is the point in the system where I could really make a difference? And what he came up with was a multi-internationally celebrated, multi-award winning organization called the Carbon Disclosure Project, where the point in the system was providing information on how it works. So he wrote to pension funds and other investors in the world stock markets and said, your investments are heavily reliant on fossil fuel. You're invested in fossil fuel companies. This leaves you highly vulnerable. So he then said, I want to write to all the world's top companies in a letter signed by you and other pension funds saying, we need to know what is your dependence on fossil fuels and what is your strategy for breaking that dependence. And all the world's top 500 FT, uh, uh, Fortune 500 companies are signed up to the Car Carbon Disclosure Project, uh, resulting in a massive cut in dependency on fossil fuels and investment in fossil fuels. So this is from intelligently scanning the system and asking where can we intervene. The third uh, tool, so tool number one is Three Horizons, tool number two is um, the points to intervene in the system, Point number three is uh, complexity thinking, complexity theory, a recognition that we live in highly complex worlds. World. So worlds in which um, a, uh, a trader can self-immolate, burn himself to death in Tunisia and the Arab Spring happens. In which two guys can meet in a pub in Totnes in England and say, should we show a film about peak oil? And ten years later, there's thousands of transition initiatives around the world to their total astonishment a world in which a dissident in Armenia can walk across the country and six months later there's a velvet revolution, and in which a nation can decide to start singing. So this is a highly complex world in which we can't know. All we're called to do is to... Two minutes, okay. Um, all we're called to do is to do what we love to do and do it to the fullest of our ability, but intelligently, not just with heart, but having really scanned the system to see where are the points for intervention. Um, I'm thinking, given I've got so little time left, um, how do I best move forward? Okay, so uh, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be leading a workshop um, called Bringing the Classroom Back to Life immediately after the session, and I will do a little more conceptual introduction on the stuff I haven't got to here. So I'm just going to sum up. We live in a world, it's clear that there are, um, we're living in a world in which there is much dynamism. We can believe that we're really stuck at the moment, that actually things are not moving. It is a moment of extraordinary, extraordinarily deep transition. 
Um, we need to bring our full selves to that process. It's not enough any longer to look to the experts, particularly in the field of economics, because they do not know what they're doing. We need to uh, remodel our education systems in which the whole being is invited in. And the good news is that even though the universities aren't doing this, the this, this student demand for this is that there is a deluge of, of student dissatisfaction that will manifest in... In new is manifesting in new educational forms. But we need to bring a political economic intelligence to the points that we decide to intervene in systems. Um, I had a section here on the, on the presentation on specifically the takeaways for eco-villages, the implications specifically for eco-villages, that maybe I'll introduce the session uh, after this with that. I just want to leave you uh, to, to really put some flesh in the bones of the potential nature of the transformation that we are currently in. I, I have little doubt that historians of the near future will look back at this moment in history, and if we get through the bottleneck of biophysical system dislocation, I'm pretty sure that one of the deep, that probably the thing that the top headline will be, this is the period where we saw the transition from centralized top-down command and control organizational forms to distributed, much more democratic, uh, networked organizational forms. And I just want to leave you with two quotes from two thinkers who I really admire on this subject. Um, the first is um, Jeremy Rifkin, who's written a book called The Third Industrial Revolution. And one of the things he says is the Third Industrial Revolution embodies the spirit of the social entrepreneurial movement sweeping the globe. In industry after industry, networks are, are competing with markets and open source commons are challenging proprietary business organizations. We're seeing this across the economy and society. And the final quote I want to leave you with is, this is a very intelligent British journalist called Paul Mason, uh, who's written a book called Post-Capitalism. And this is from a piece he wrote in The Guardian called The End of Capitalism Has Begun. <clears throat> he says, the main contradiction today is between the possibility of free, abundant goods and information and a system of monopolies, banks and governments trying to keep things private, scarce and commercial. Everything comes down to the struggle between the network and the hierarchy, between old forms of society molded around capitalism and new forms of society that prefigure what comes next. So this is the point that we're at. It's a moment of deep potential transition of systems, technology enabled, but in which transformation of consciousness is a critical component. But for us to make that journey, we need to be recognizing that there is not one pathway to prosperity. There are multiple context-specific possibilities, and to be able to identify and seize the possibility, we need to bring all our learning faculties to the table. Thank you.